Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. This is the Inept General, and welcome to our Paravon Law video in our series looking at the different dukedoms of Bretonia. If you'd like to check out any of our previous videos, uh, there will be a link popping up in the top right-hand corner, or you'll find a link to the playlist down in the description below. But let's kick off by having a look at the Dukedom of Paravon. Now, Paravon is located in what one could describe as kind of the northeastern part of Bretonia. It is a unique and wonderful place, and we'll delve into a little bit of the history of Paravon first. So, Paravon, like much of Bretonia, was its own individual territory or kingdom before the great uniter Gilles Le Breton came on the scene and made Bretonia one nation. Now, during the time of great strife for uh, what were then known as the Bretoni people, who were the initial tribe of people who colonized the land of Bretonia and was the common ancestry of all Bretonians, there was a lot going on. Orcs were invading, beastmen were invading, really humans' days were numbered in the territory that would one day be known as the Kingdom of Bretonia. But, in the last minute, and the final battle, Gilles Le Breton had started to lead a counter-offensive, blessed with new powers given to him by the Lady of the Lake. So he was storming around the country. Now, Paravan at this time was led by a character by the name of, my best attempt at pronunciation here is Agilgar. Now, Agilgar was a legendary fighter. He was well-renowned for having one of the most famous Pegasus, perhaps ever, if not at least in Bretonia, and his famous Pegasus went by the name Glorfinnel. Now, Glorfinnel and Agilgar were legendary heroes. They'd fight animals together, but his city of Paravan was under siege. Greenskins were storming the place with the aids of giants. Now, Paravan itself will get into a bit more detail later as the city, but it is carved into a mountain. And from the opposite side of the summit, imagine a kind of Minas Tirith, if you will. These giants from the peaks were hurling down huge boulders. Greenskins had just about breached the walls. Gobos were kind of swarming over the city. It was really the final days. But Agilgar and his trusty Pegasus were bravely battling the giants, slaying one after the other after the other, just doing his part to fight back the surge of an inevitable wave crashing over the city of putrid green beings. The battle's continuing, and in the final moment, Gilles Le Breton and his army come charging over the hill, and they liberate the city from the siege. Now, there's been kind of a few aspects that have joined Gilles Le Breton. A few factions have joined, because Gilles has been liberating cities all over the place, liberating territories. And Agogar, after the battle, meets these guys like, Oh, nice to meet you chaps, thank you for saving my ass, as it were. And they ask him to join the Grail Companions. Now, he was the eighth initiate into the Grail Companions, and the Grail Companions were really just the first ever Grail Knights. They drunk from Grail with the help of the Lady of the Lake, and they became super-powered. So he became the eighth one of the Grail Companions and went on to fight beside Gilles Le Raton for the remaining battles of his campaign to unify Bretonia. Now, he particularly distinguished himself in the ninth of 12 famous battles that were fought. If you're more interested in all these battles and the exact story of the unification of Bretonia, do check out my Green Knight stroke Gilles Le Breton lore video popping up in the top right-hand corner now, or as uh, previously, you'll find the link in the description below. It was in the ninth battle over the skies of Moussillon, where a horde of undead had taken over the city, that he really distinguished himself. Fighting against foul bats, terror guys in the lightning streak skies, he swooped and slayed beast after beast. He made a true legend of himself that day above the skies of Moussillon. So after the battles were fought and the day was won, the Bretonians all got together and decided to make Gilles Le Breton their king, and they would all be made dukes and running their own original territories under the leadership of the king. That is how Paravon the Dukedom was founded, and Agilgar became the first Duke of Paravon. Now, this happened around the year 979 of the Imperial Calendar, so around 1500 years before the current Total War Warhammer timeline. In his lifetime, after the unification of Britannia, Agilgar and his trusty Pegasus became legends in their own right. Many more battles were fought, many more days saved, many more monsters slain. However, 
he did eventually die when his infamous Pegasus, Glorfinel, was trapped in the skies by two wyverns, was slaughtered, and Agilgar fell to his death. Now, in the days, Glorfinel as a Pegasus was a highly intelligent animal, much prized, and he went on to sire the entire line, it is said, of what would become royal Pegasus, which are thought of slightly better than normal Pegasus, bigger, stronger, smarter, that kind of idea for the royal Pegasus. So he's said to be their originator, um, he's responsible for all of the breed of royal Pegasus that we get in Bretonia today. And as such a royal sort of symbol of the province, of their first First Duke, it became the sigil for Paravon itself, so it's Glorfinnel portrayed on the shield of Paravon. I was unsure whether Pegasus were popular in the region before, or they became popular through the use of Glorfinnel and the famous First Duke, and it kind of caught on with Voldemilty, but to this day, there's a lot of Pegasus in Paravon, perhaps more than in any other dukedom. Uh, the nobles like to ride them more than most places, and they kind of go around, so much so that it's maybe to the detriment of them looking after after the road networks because they never really travel by road, they're always in the skies. And as such, even coachmen around the dukedom have noted that uh, when going through Paravon, give twice the amount of time you would to any other road because the roads have been let to rot so badly because the nobles don't know what a bad condition they're in. And they would never listen to peasants about it, so they won't have a clue. Paravon did play its part in the history of Bretonia, but we're not going to go into every uh, situation. We'll just maybe jump a thousand years ahead to around the year 1813 of the imperial calendar to perhaps the second most notable duke of Paravon that ever sort of took up the dukedom. So the next duke we're going to talk about is a duke called Escargul. Now Escargul was a duke, uh, not very nicely named duke, Escargul meaning stale in French for those of you who don't know. He ran the kingdom when the whole of Bretonia was hit by the red pox. Now, the Red Pox was swiftly followed by a Skaven invasion, and those perhaps ignorant in Bretonia might not have put the two together, but the Skaven do like a plague before they storm onto the surface of the world. And so that's what they did, and Bretonia was in a lot of trouble. Paravon was on the verge of being the next target on Skaven's list, and it's here that Escargur, the Duke of Paravon, decided to just say, like, that's it. We have to ride out and meet the Skaven in open land. We can't cower behind our castles. This is how they'll get us. They'll come through our sewers. They'll dig under our walls. This is not the way to go. So he set off with all the cavalry he had, and they were mostly light, quick-moving cavalry, and some knights and knights errant and everything have you as well, and of course, Pegasus riders at the same time. But he couldn't leave the whole place undefended, so he left all the archers behind, putting his army at serious disadvantage. But they rode out and started to try and meet the Skaven threat, who were approaching uh, their neighbors Quinell at the time. Now, with the Duke riding out of Paravan, this kind of flips over to the Wood Elves. They They've long used humans in Bretonia as kind of a shield versus the dangers of the rest of the world. Like, let's let the humans sacrifice their lives so we don't have to. And that's why they kind of allow Bretonia the freedoms they do sometimes around the edge of their wood. So Orion and Aerith, they're sitting there going, look, he's abandoned Paravan. If Paravan falls, if he falls in this battle, that's us. We're next on the list for the Skaven, so we have to help them win here and now. And so it's one of the rare occasions where the Wood Elves march out and they went to back up the Duke of Paravan at the Battle of Quinell. So you have the Bretonians and the Wood Elves fighting side by side to turn the tide of the Skaven threat. Didn't end it entirely, there were many more battles to follow, but it really flipped the script and allowed Bretonia hope for a victory one day. And that was all led due to the initiative of the Duke of Paravan, but also help from the Wood Elves at the same time. Moving on from the history of Paravan, let's have a look at its uh, geography and kind of its land features. Now, Paravan itself is mostly woodland and mountain. You can see it's kind of an odd sliver of a province up against the Grey Mountains and delving into the northern part of the Lauren Forest. Now, many of you will have a lot of questions about the Wood Elves allowing them to have. And north of that river, it seems like the Wood Elves allowed the humans of Paravan to kind of take up that land, although they are very closely monitored by the Wood Elves. And if they overstep their bounds, the Wood Elves will step in and take any lives they feel they need to. 
but they are for the most part allowed to operate in this northern section of the wood. Most of the population of Paravon is located in what they call the Vale, which is a, a fertile valley full of farmland, and it's where most of their food is produced, where most of them live. But also up in the mountains, the Grey Mountain Range there in Paravon is actually less jagged than it is maybe on the Empire side or in other parts of this mountain range. And as such, it does allow some fertile tracts of land up on higher altitudes. However, they're not frivolous with their fertile land up in the mountains, and they will build their houses on steep slopes or even into slopes rather than use them to take up precious fertile land. So you're much more likely to find really steeply stacked housing in the mountain villages than you are further down. Paravan's also a very important uh, location as far as trade is involved. As I understand it, there are two passes from the Empire to Paravon. One is Axe Bite Pass and the other is the Grey Lady Pass. Now, these both allow trade, but also mean that in the event of a war, Paravan has to be ready to be the front line against the Empire should the worst happen and the Empire and Bretonia go to war with each other. They're kind of very aware of this dual uh, sort of role they play as a trade partner and also as a shield for the rest of Bretonia. As far as people sort of housing the wooded part of Paravan, they tend to build houses around trees. They won't chop down trees necessarily, they build a house around the tree and they, rather than build walls or anything like that, tend to build high platforms. So when orcs or gobos come tearing through the woods down from the mountains, all the people kind of run up to these high platforms and live up there for a while. One presumes they don't chop down the trees willy-nilly because of feared retribution, as I previously said, from the Wood Elves. And that's really about it for the geography. Very different types of way of living in this kind of small dukedom, uh, but very interesting ways they've adapted to different environments within the dukedom itself. So, moving on to some of the most important places in the dukedom of Paravan, the first one we're going to start with is the Glade of Children. Now, the Glade of Children is kind of a haunting place if you were to see it in real life. It's essentially a wooded glade with a big, very still water pool in the middle of it. And all around, if you didn't know what was going on, you'd find it haunting. There's just little dolls in various states of decay littered all around this pool. What you'll see sometimes around the pool is there'll also be groups of women around the place as well. And the idea of this pool is that when the Fae kidnap Bretonian children, particularly those gifted in magic, as we know that Bretonian children tend to get kidnapped if they have magical gifts, the boys, what happens to them is a mystery, but the girls tend to become enchantresses working for the Fae enchantress. Now, sometimes it's said that their mistake has been made, and the children that are kidnapped are actually returned because it's found out that actually no they didn't have any magical gifts to speak of and so are returned sometimes now this is where that happens now the women waiting by the water will have lost children themselves but the children returned to them will not be theirs most likely almost never happens it's their own children returned to them what happens is these women go to a glade broken and grieving and are maybe just hoping for a replacement child and it said that they're returned only when all the women are asleep in the glade. If anyone's awake, no one's getting anything. Much like Santa Claus, no one's getting squat if there's a peak of an eye open. But if the women are awake, sometimes they'll wake up with a child asleep in their arms. And they'll leave a doll of their lost children behind as thank you for giving them a different child. So it's kind of a haunting adoption scenario for people who have lost children and just desperately grieving mothers sitting in a glade. Now, in the Warhammer world, sleeping in an open forest without any cover or shelter or walls or people there to protect you is a very dangerous thing. And sometimes some of these women just go straight up missing. But for the most part, sometimes they get a child when they've been asking for one. Next, we're gonna switch our attention over to the mountain range. And in the mountain range, you'll notice the Sanglak Castle. Now, Sanglak Castle is a bit of a mystery. Around 100 years ago, it was found abandoned and the noble family who had built it were found slaughtered therein. Now, finding a whole family slaughtered isn't that unusual in the Warhammer world. It happens. And so the king or the duke just set up another noble family to go and take over the running of the castle. These guys lasted 10 years and then again, they were all found slaughtered by orcs. 
So you're like, okay, so orcs obviously killed this second family. Let's put someone who's been had some experience fighting orcs, and maybe he can make it more of a fortress. So they put a sort of knight commander in charge of the castle and said, look, this is yours, you can lit your family up. And you thought, he's a militaristic man, he'll know how to fight off any oncoming orcs and what have you. He did last five years longer than the last family. He lasted 15 years before he and his family were found absolutely slaughtered. At that point, the Bretonians abandoned it and said, okay, if the orcs want it, the orcs can have it. And then, at some point, the orcs being what they are would range down the mountain, kidnap people and take them back up. So scouts sent to try and find these people came across the castle and it was dead quiet and inside it was just slaughtered orcs everywhere. Now from the wounds and the weapons around it looked like orcs had just slaughtered each other and no one could make head nor tail of it. So from time to time scouts would keep an eye on the place and you know another group of orcs moved in only again to be found completely slaughtered. And then from that point of view, as far as anyone could tell, the orcs abandoned it. So all anyone can tell of what's going on in this castle is it seems, just from the weapon wounds, that a group of orcs or a group of greenskins are in there, not wanting anyone to live in that castle. Now why this is, is just an absolute mystery, but it's a place probably best avoided if you're looking to set up home anywhere. So that's the sort of mysteries of Sanglac Castle. Next, we will move on to the mighty city of Paravon itself. Carved out of a sort of outcropping mountain of the Grey Mountains, the city stands splendid as it has stood for almost 2,000 years. Carved out of the very mountain itself, every bit of it is merged in with the mountains, from the shops to the homes to the Grail chapels to the soaring towers of the city itself, all carved from the rock of the mountain and just standing tall and resplendent. Now, there are some laws in Bretonia which one would think would forbid this, known as the sumptuary laws, in that the idea of law in Bretonia is that no peasants can own a home made of rock. Now, the homes made of rock that the peasants lived in in Paravon, you know, one could construe as a stone home, which they're not allowed to have. Um, but the idea is that the Paravon have got around themselves by arguing that the home of the peasantry is more akin to a cave than any kind of actual nice civilized home, and so they allow them to have these homes carved into the rock of Paravon. Now, they're not too far wrong, given how destitute most of the peasants are. It's not unlike living in a cave itself. Being a structure that stood for 2,000 years, and being you have to carve out every new home from the mountainside itself, it can take a bit of time and is slow to expand, and slower than the people populating the city. As such, it's been found a little bit easier to dig down into the ground around the mountain, although technically I completely understand that from a geological point of view, digging down into a mountain should be just as hard as digging into a mountain, but the Warhammer law kind of ignores this and goes on the idea that digging down is easier to dig into than sideways through a mountain. So they say that it's easier and quicker to build homes underneath the ground level of a mountain than there is to build into the side. I think there's a fundamental misunderstanding of how mountains work, but that's how the law writers went with it. And as such, there's sort of a huge tunnel network in Paravon, and it's said that you can get from anywhere in the city to anywhere else with taking less than 10 steps outside in the open sky. And so maybe there are some peasants who live in what are effectively underground caves as well. Now, perhaps due to this mass tunneling, it's maybe made them feel at home, but really, Paravon is the only place with a significant dwarven population in Bretonia, and most of these dwarves are actually repatriated sort of imperial dwarves. They've been living in the Empire and then moved over to Bretonia. However, there are some who have come directly from dwarven strongholds as well. So, you know, a mixture of dwarves, although they do tend to mostly keep to themselves in their own sort of dwarven community within the city. And that's really about it for the city of Paravon, just this majestic city carved out of a mountain, sort of Pegasus twirling about its towers, uh, must be a magical place to see, and I wish we had a slightly better rendering of it in Total War Warhammer. Now, in terms of the commerce of Paravon, as I mentioned, it's a particularly good trading location with not only the two passes to the Empire providing trade outlets, but also the river trade that provides them with a good bit of money as well. And they're also known for do 
doing a bit of logging. Now, the logging is not hugely commercial because obviously the wood elves would kick up a huge fuss, but they do feel that the wood is sacred and they sometimes chop down the wood to make out their grail chapels. Although, even in the grail chapels, the sacred wood of the forest is pretty much. Uh, sparsely used. As such, one has to imagine it's pretty expensive as well, and so they probably make a good mint from doing that. As far as the majority of the people in Paravon are concerned, they kind of see themselves as travelers, world weary, shall we say, to a certain degree, and this is because there's this strong tradition of moving people around within the dukedom of Paravon. Now, this starts when one's coming up to one's adolescence, and then one's sent away from one's birth home to live with relatives in another village. This happens again when one is sort of going to train for a trade, you're sent to yet another village. And again, when you're due to get married, you're sent to yet another village. And as such, they kind of move around and it scatters families all across Paravon, perhaps making them stronger as one people. I'm not sure for the actual logic behind it, but it's just what they do. Now all these families come together for the big holidays, at least one holiday a year, because they're peasants, they don't get much time off. Although even giving one holiday is very much against the spirit of the nobility of Bretonia. But... They are allowed to get away with it, and it's usually the summer holiday that a whole families will get together in one place and celebrate being a family. But this kind of moving around gives them an aspect that they've seen everything there is to see, although they've only seen a small fraction operating within the dukedom itself, let alone the whole of Britonia, let alone the whole of the Warhammer world. But they kind of up themselves in that way, whereas most peasants in Britonia will born, die, and live in the same village. They see themselves as slightly above that. Now, as I said, there's different sorts of geographical areas in Paravon and as such people get their own tradition. So forest folk are uh, kind of looked upon weirdly by the sort of normal people of uh, Paravon who live let's say in the Vale and in the Fertile Valley um, and that is because they act very differently particularly around trees they get sort of very delicate and very nervous and it's said that they act as though if they were to give a scratch on a tree they'd be meted with harsh punishment. Now it has been said that yes if they do mistreat trees it's not completely unheard of of that uh, Bretonians from Paravon have been found disemboweled with their entrails spread across the trees of branches from time to time. But you know what? I'd probably live nervously in that way as well. They're so looked upon as different that they're sometimes maybe considered the Fae, which is maybe elvish, um, but they're not. They have no ties to elvishness. They just, you know, respect the trees. But it is said that they have a heightened sense of danger in the world around them, which is completely true, thus the threat of tree disembowelment and uh, really always being watched by the wood elves of their behavior when they are going through the forest. And people who have escaped this forest community always say they were just sick and tired of feeling like they were being watched every second of every day and so left. So there is this kind of paranoia. It's only paranoia if you're wrong and they're not wrong. They are actually being watched by the wood elves. So now let's move on to a couple of sort of more notable characters who either hail from or currently are around Paravon. Now, there's only really a couple of these that sprung to mind for me. The first one is a chap by the name of Baron Marcel de Paravon, and he was an interesting character. Even from a young pup, he kind of was always exploring, always getting into nooks and crannies around his family's chateau, and really just had a hankering for the unknown. And this kind of went into him as a growing man, and he, for his questing mission, didn't go too far from Paravon, but ended up going to Massive Orcal, which is a territory kind of in the middle of Bretonia, a little mountain mountain range patch that is completely inhabited and wild and really kind of run by greenskins for the most part and he went in there and adventured around all the nooks and crannies exposing himself to great danger but he came away from that experience unperturbed and by the time his father died and he inherited the title along with all the family wealth he wanted to go even further afield. To this end, he built three great ships and sailed across the sea to Lustria, where he wanted to explore the unknown world there. He made landfall and set up a camp and sort of set up fields for the peasantry to farm and really was the beginnings of a potential Bretonian colony 
in Lustria. From then on, he went to explore the interior, finding many treasures, a lot of gold, and for the most part, the lizard men were happy to let him get away with it. Um, but then there came a point where he came across the tomb of a slan mage priest and stole some actual plaques of the old ones and this is beyond the pale for the lizard men so they marched across to his encampment by the cover of night which is actually maybe a blessing in disguise so the bretonians didn't really see them coming they killed all the guards opened the gate raided the treasury and took back all their treasures now most of the troops were asleep thus the lizard men weren't really after slaughter they just wanted their stuff back and so just killed the guards who were on hand and everyone else kind of escape punishment. So the lizard men go off back into the jungle and Marcel decides to, you know, give chase and that's kind of where the story's left. It was kind of the openings of a fun potential campaign for Bretonia in Lustria in a White Dwarf magazine. Now, you can kind of play with that idea of your imagination, but it's nice to know that there's a chap from Paravon exploring the jungles of Lustria, probably getting into all sorts of trouble. The next chap I wanted to mention was not as well known. He actually features in a series of books that really highlight uh, life in Bretonia. Now, the sort of main character in those books is a chap by the name of Calard de Garamont, but it's really an ally of his known as Lodeterre. Uh, beloved of Paravon. Now he was a pompous ass, a very famous Pegasus Knight. Um, he would ride around and he would kind of befriend stroke be part-time allies with the main character in this series of novels. Now, along their adventures, there was a time where Loditer uh, learned of a woman lady, a Bretonian, who'd been kidnapped by Norskans. And him and Callard went over to try and rescue this woman. They fought the Norskans in their encampment and they saved her. It turns out she was actually the ex fiance of Callard. And so they rescued her, but it turns out the Chaos Lord had gotten her pregnant, the one who'd kidnapped her. So he sets off, he gathers troops, he sets off with an army to go and find her, resulting in the invasion of Lyonnaise in the north of Bretonia. Now, our friend here, the beloved of Bretonia, ended up becoming quite famous for his rescue of this lady, and his pomposity grew with his ego. But soon enough, he was leading a, let's say, a regiment of Pegasus knights. And when the invasion came from this Norskan faction, he rose to meet it. And there was fierce fighting in the skies. Now, at some point, he is said to have fought a Chaos Spawn. And I have to imagine this is some kind of flying Chaos Spawn, because it managed to rip the throat out of his Pegasus, causing him to fall from it, landing on a tower, kind of finding his way in the tower, one Zooms, finding a Norseman, getting in a hand-to-hand -hand fisticuffs wrestling match, and being thrown out a window. Now, he had survived this. He'd managed to grab onto the windowsill, and a peasant had come up and was in the tower during the fighting. And he asked the peasant for help, but being the pompous ass he was, he couldn't help but call him a dirty, filthy peasant, or something along those lines, to which the peasant trod on his hand, and he fell to his death in the ocean below. So that was the end of him, but he'd had some misadventures, and do check into that series of novels if you have a huge interest in life in Bretonia and some of the goings-on therein. Now, last but by no means least, let's focus on the big guy himself, the Duke of Bretonia, currently Duke Cassian. Now, Cassian is the youngest of the Dukes in Bretonia at the moment. He's in his early 20s, and he's also already a Grail Knight. Now, his father died while he was on his questing mission, um, so he came back, didn't realize he'd inherited the title already, and went straight into being the Duke of Paravon. Now, he's a fantastic fighter, a keen adventurer, and a slayer of many beasts. However, this is not necessarily all the fantastic traits one needs to rule well. And largely, he's let a few things slide in his dukedom, namely being the anchor that holds all the other nobles together. As such, without partaking any kind of diplomacy, he has let a few conflicts arise. 
Up in the north, there are two lords by the name of Sir Leutpold and Sir Fredegar, uh, who are at the moment arguing about who should be able to establish a river toll on the Grismere River. Now, it would not only cause there to be maybe armed conflict between these two lords, but also put a stranglehold on trade for the rest of the dukedom and really cause problems later on. However, he's largely ignored this, so this is a potential flashpoint that might kick off in his dukedom. Another threat is to the south by a chap of the name of Sir Calodric, and he is looking to take over a strip of mountain range in the Grey Mountains that is currently under the territory of the Empire because he thinks there's rich mining potential there. However, any hostile act to do this would inevitably lead to Parabon going toward the Empire and potentially the whole of Bretonia going toward the Empire. So he really needs to get on top of that situation, much to the endless frustration of his counselors. So they're trying to advise him to sit down and actually rule, whereas he just wants to go off and be the hero. Now, he is still a very gifted warrior, so much so that some even claim he is the original founder of Paravon, Agilgar Reborn. Uh, so he is very highly thought of despite his lack of potential ruling skills, shall we say. And that brings us to the conclusion of our video on Paravan, guys. As I said, do check out the description below if you want to look up the playlist for all the different dukedoms we've covered so far. Um, but other than that, guys, as always, a huge thank you for watching, and I'll catch you on the next one.